couple of administrative comments this morning as we get started. Three, actually, I edited one more in after, last, uh, after the first service. First, there is no PowerPoint or notes for you today. I apologize for that. I was not able to get everything done I needed to by the time that stuff needed to come together. Um, but somewhere it says, in the beginning was the word, right? And so God revealed himself in words and not in pictures, so we will be okay. Uh, secondly, I don't often script my messages, um, but this one I did. It just depends on my frame of mind and kind of how preparation goes. And so this one is scripted. Therefore, the delivery might look a little different. Um, I might not be able to make as much eye contact as I would like um, just because I, I want the words to be right. And third, there is much food here. After the first service, someone stopped me and was gracious and complimentary. And she meant this in the best of ways. And she said, there's so much food there. So I know that there's a lot that's going to be coming at you. But just bask in it. Take what you want and just bask in it. Let it nourish you. All right? As we begin, I thought of a, a story from my childhood when I was a young boy. And some of you may say, what are you talking about? You're still a young boy. But when I was much younger than I am now, about five years old, I stayed with a friend of mine. His name is Seth. And it was the first time I had stayed overnight with anyone. And um, about the middle of the night, being the first time away from home, guess what happened? Got homesick right and wanted to go home and was crying and longing for home and my friend was not sympathetic by the way he was like be quiet and go to sleep <laughs> you know he was at home he didn't care um, but I was homesick and you know as I've been looking around the world I've been feeling a bit homesick lately to be honest with you things like moral confusion governmental transformation presidential politics increasing secularization world chaos with growing dangers and violence the resurgent rise of Islam, increasing persecution of Christians, and so on. All of these things have kind of made me just miss home a little bit. All of these things can be shameful, saddening, discouraging, and even overwhelming, can't it? Might there even be sometimes the temptation, however short or however fleeting, to despair or hopelessness or a feeling of helplessness and powerlessness of, of all the things that are going on? But... The Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I've recently discovered the nostalgic power of photographs. When you see pictures of your family, friends, or home, or some event that you associate with happiness and goodness, doesn't it elicit a wonderful feeling inside of you, a, a feeling of security and well-being? Isn't it nice to kind of browse the photo album? Doesn't it produce a sense of home and of belonging? Doesn't it bring about joy in you when you reminisce? I don't mean to be dramatic here or overstate my case, but in some small way, doesn't it make you want to keep going, to keep living life, to keep making more of those memories? Because in spite of all the mundane moments and regular routines and even the tough times, you realize that life is worth it, right? So today we're going to look at a picture of our home. There are several portraits of heaven scattered throughout God's word, but perhaps one of the clearest, most concise, and most beautiful in scripture is found in Revelation 21 and 22, and we're going to look at a portion of that. Revelation chapter 21 this morning, verses one through eight. If you're physically able at this time, I'm gonna ask you to join me in standing out of honor and reverence for God's word as we read it together. Revelation chapter 21, verses one through eight. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, 
As for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you aren't worried about national news or global events because your world is too big in itself right now. Maybe you're wrestling with grief and loneliness, depression, illness, marital struggles, family challenges, uncertainty about the future, or anything else that is huge and that has captivated your attention. It's my hope this morning that as we look at this picture of heaven about what awaits us, that any temptation to hopelessness, helplessness, or despair will be banished as our souls are renewed with sustaining security, anticipation, and motivating joy and hope. And if you're not a Christian, or if you're not sure that you're a Christian this morning, I and we as members of this church family want to invite you into the family and say welcome home. Three things I want us to see about heaven this morning. First, heaven is being with God. Heaven is being with God. The text says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. This is the goal of Christianity. This is Eden restored, paradise regained. This is the great reversal of the tragic third chapter of Genesis. This is the grand story of the Bible concluded, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. This is at the heart of what Christianity is about. Man and God united again in perfect, right relationship. No more running, no more rebellion, no more rejection. All is as it should be. Perfect love, perfect worship, perfect peace, perfect protection, and perfect provision. This is the consummation, the completion of our redemption. This is the realization of our reconciliation. And what a joyous thought that for those of us who are in Christ this morning, we already have that relationship right now. Can you believe that? Those of us in Christ are not enemies of God, but we are counted as his friends. He is not mad at you. You are at peace with God. You have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. And while our reconciliation to God is real in this very moment, it is so in a spiritual sense. But one day, that faith shall be sight. That is at the core of Christianity. This is what we are to be about as Christians, bringing God and man together, bringing people into right relationship with God where he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. You see, we are ministers of reconciliation. We get to bring this message of hope and reconciliation to others. If you don't really want to be with God, I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound very strong, and it is, but it's true. If you don't really want to be with God, then Christianity isn't for you. If you don't want to be right in a right relationship with God, to be with him for eternity, to be in a worshipful, submissive, reconciled, restored relationship with God, then this thing isn't for you. You see, Christianity is not about a little civil religion. It's not about making bad people behave better. It's not about appeasing your conscience, devotion to a family tradition, or duty to a cultural expectation. It's not finally about transforming culture, or righting injustice, or ushering in a kingdom on earth. Christianity is not about a get out of hell free card, or the notion that heaven is better than the alternative. And in fairness, while hell is a terrifying reality, and it is a legitimate motivator in coming to Christ, a desire for God, for God, to know him and to be with him ought to be the deeper and nobler desire that develops in us over time. Because he has done so much, shouldn't our love for him compel us to be with him in that perfect relationship for eternity? When you truly love someone, don't you want to be with them? And over time, the more you get to know them, don't you deepen in your ability to appreciate them for who they are? Many of us have loved ones in heaven that we will see again, that we want to see again. But that's not what's so great about heaven. There's nothing in the least wrong with wanting to be re reunited with loved ones. But may I submit to you that not even that is a high enough reason to want 
to be in heaven. I believe we will see our loved ones who are in heaven. I think we will. And I think we're going to know them. But more than that, we will see God. Think of that. We will see God. And won't his presence, his greatness, his goodness, and his glory far outshine anyone or anything else there? The streets of gold, the foundation stones that are gems, the gates of pearl may sound great, but the opulence of heaven will be paled in comparison to the radiant, glorious, majestic beauty of God. Won't he be the center of attention? Shouldn't he be? Won't our breath be taken and our attention captivated by him over and above anyone else or any other thing that is there? Shouldn't it be? Don't you want to see God? Don't you want to be with him? Don't you want to know in greater depth this absolutely holy, unfathomable, incomprehensible God that we love and worship and serve? We will. That's what heaven is. That's what Christianity's ultimate end is goal, message, and purposes. We will see God. We will be with him. We will be like him. We will know him. We will be in perfect relationship to him. Heaven, then, is the core of the Christian message, ultimately, fully, and eternally realized. Sinful people saved by a gracious, holy God into a reconciled and restored relationship with him. We might even say, in a broader sense, that's the ultimate hope of humanity. Remember Genesis 3? After they had sinned, our first parents, the representatives of the human race, Adam and Eve, they sinned and they heard God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what did they do? They hid themselves. They, the only humans, were ashamed and sorrowful and fearful. But not so in heaven, right? It's the opposite. In heaven, we run to God, right into his very presence, and we rest there and bask there, rejoice there and worship there. Heaven is the purpose of of humanity fully eternally achieved with God at the center of it and us in his presence unashamed and unreserved. John Piper has a now famous line, oft quoted line. It's this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. You see, that is what heaven will be. God will be perfectly glorified because we will be perfectly satisfied in him. The greatest longing of our hearts and souls will be filled, our purpose achieved. We will be with him. Heaven is being with God. Heaven is where God is. Second, I want you to see this. Heaven is the end of death. Heaven is the end of death. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is the end of tears, of death, of mourning, of crying, and pain. Think about the comfort of someone gently wiping a tear from your eye, the soft caress of a thumb across your cheek, imparting with it its tenderness, comfort, and love. Is this not a wonderful hope that we have then in this verse? Doesn't this make us long for heaven that God's thumb is going to wipe that away? One year ago, this week actually, as I was thinking about this week and preparing for this message and reflecting on life, um, I realized that one year ago, I was called upon to do the funeral for a 13-year-old boy who was drowned in a canoeing accident. His family is not a believing family. And at the funeral for this young boy, I witnessed the most heart-wrenching, soul-stirring scene I've ever known. I watched person after person touch and hug the family. I watched people sit beside them and give them tissues and wipe tears, but there was no relief. No amount of touch or of wiping the tears could impart comfort or remove their pain. After it was over, the family had a time alone together for a final viewing of the body. It was almost too much to take. I saw the absolute, I'm gonna share this with you, it's heavy. It gets better, but it's heavy. I saw the absolute agony and I heard the piercing, penetrating cries of a mother bereaved of her child. The grief, the sorrow, and the tears were uncontainable, uncontrollable, unstoppable. I cannot even communicate to you the depth of the despair of that moment. It was palpable. The room was filled with it. 
to watch older brothers clenched jaws as they stood over their little brother's casket, to watch younger brothers, there were two of them, to watch younger brothers' shoulders heave as they were lifted to kiss the lifeless body of their big brother and their best friend, to watch a father stand there pulling his wife and his daughter close to him, trying to be silent and strong, trying to give them a pillar of support when inside he was crumbling, to watch this boy's friends grimace from inner pain as they were given the task of carrying the body of someone that one week ago was celebrating the start of summer with them. It was all horrifying. It was awful. It was heart-wrenching and soul-stirring. I'm trying, but I can't even tell you what it was like. Maybe you know. Maybe you've been there as a witness or even as a victim. It makes me think of some of you. Maybe you've experienced the echoes of sorrow that resound in the whole of your heart that were left by the death of a child or a grandchild. There are constant reminders all around you, and each tragedy like it brings all of it back. Everywhere we see signs of it, incessantly we are reminded of its inescapable presence, death. And all around us, we experience its horrible effects, tears, mourning, crying, and pain. It makes me think about the experience of sitting at the deathbed of an older person, and perhaps some of you have shared that experience as well. Though the circumstances are not the same, such a death is still a great loss, no less a loss to their loved ones. Think about a man who was active and strong his entire life, literally decimated by disease and overpowered by death. Lying there at the end, weak and finally helpless, he leaves this world another victim of death. Whether a life is tragically cut short or lived to fullness of days, we are reminded we cannot escape death's stalking clutches. Death is no respecter of persons or of age. It is merciless, heartless, and cold. It haunts every person. It makes victims of everyone. And death celebrates and flaunts another victory in the world, leaving behind tears, mourning, crying, and pain. As a cruel serial killer, it leaves calling cards for the loved ones of its victims, reminding them that one day their name will be called. It makes me think of many of you, members of this church family, a church family of which I'm a part, people I'm growing to know and love. And it makes me stop and think about some of you. Some of you have had loved ones taken from you, and I think of the ensuing grief and the hurt and the sorrow, pain, sadness, loneliness, and helplessness, helplessness that you have felt, and maybe even some of you still feel very acutely. It makes me think of some of you who uh, are constantly bombarded by reminders of death, who must constantly witness its effects in your life and in the lives of others. It makes me think of you who may live under the specter of death, perhaps due to a diagnosis or a disease, or simply with bodies experiencing the normal degradation that this fallen world brings. Makes me think of you who may live in the shadow of the fear of death. It even makes me think of you who are living without a thought of death or without a care for death. Maybe that's because you're young enough that you haven't really experienced or understood much loss in your life. Maybe you're young and healthy and you don't think that death will come, but one day at a time unknown to us or to anyone around us, Death may call our name and snuff out our life, whether slowly or instantly. Surely by now, all of us are feeling the darkness, the despair, and the weight of death's reality and rule in this world and in our lives. It is inevitable, irresistible, and awful. But that's the present state of things. That's the fallen world in which we live. That is death, the great enemy of humanity, flaunting its temporary reign of this world. Death brings tears and mourning and crying and pain, and all around us we see it. We hear it in sobs and sighs and screams. We feel it in our hearts and in our souls when words fail us because we see the faces of the bereaved. We feel it in their weak embraces or in their strong cleaving to us. We feel it in the warmth of their tears as they pour down our neck. And then we read this verse. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Heaven is the hope 
that this present world, this current state of affairs is not all there is. Heaven is the hope that one day death, which taunts and tortures us, will meet its match. Heaven is the hope that one day death, which has for so long mercilessly inflicted its devastation, will be defeated, brought to an end. Heaven is the hope of these things. And Revelation comforts us by assuring us that, figuratively speaking, death will be defeated and repaid with merciless torment day and night forever and ever in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. Death, with all of its accompanying minions, tears, mourning, crying, pain, will be forever gone, wiped from existence and wiped from our memories, replaced only with the bliss and joy of everlasting life in the presence of our life-giving God. Can you imagine it? Heaven is the place where God comes to us and with his own hand wipes away our tears for good. Can you imagine the love and the relief and the comfort that that will impart? With his own hand, God obliterates the old order and makes all things new. With his own hand, he banishes mourning and crying and pain. That's heaven. God steps in and defends us. He vindicates the victims of death. He destroys the destroyer. Like he dealt with our sin in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ, he removes death from us as far as the east is from the west. That's heaven. It's the end of death. Third, heaven is the home for those who want it. First, we've seen that heaven is where God is, and second, we've seen that heaven is the end of death, and now third, we see that heaven is the home for those who want it. It is the water for souls who are parched, dry, thirsty, longing for something more than this world can give them. It is the free gift of God to those who know they have nothing to give God, who understand that no payment is adequate or necessary for the life-giving, soul-satisfying water that only God can give. Those who thirst for this water know they cannot find it in this life on earth. They know that nothing this world can provide will ultimately truly satisfy their souls or quench their thirst because they have come to know that there is so much more than the old order of things, than this old, fallen, deteriorating, death-ruled world. They have come to know that they were created for a greater place and a greater purpose, and their soul thirsts for more. As pilgrims, travelers, and sojourners in this world, they cry out, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You see, heaven is the home for those who want it. That home is their inheritance, a far greater inheritance than any on earth. They know that the spiritual satisfaction of the spring of the water of life in heaven is far more precious than any temporary treasure or fleeting pleasure that this world can afford. Heaven is the home for those who want eternal spiritual satisfaction more than they want what this world has to offer. They are the ones who conquer this world with all of its pleasures and punishments. The inheritors of heaven are those who resist this world's allurements, awards, and accolades, who resist this world's pursuits and pleasures, who resist this world's anger and acts of falsehood, whether false words or false worship. They are not like the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, or liars. Those who inhabit, inherit heaven are not cowards, when the world pressures them to conform or face persecution with courage, they stand and conquer, even if it means dying rather than denying the precious Lord who died and purchased them with his own blood. They are not faithless. When the world tells them that they are foolish for believing in what they cannot see, they say, we walk by faith and not by sight. They are not faithless like nominal Christians who, when challenged by the world's intellectuals and elites, give up ground and back down. They are not faithless like nominal Christians who, when faced with the pressure to be politically correct or face the wrath of the state, back down and essentially demonstrate that their faith is in vain, or at least not all that important. They are not like the detestable, engaging in or condoning things God says he hates. The inheritors of heaven don't defile themselves with base, earthly things that God despises because they realize that God's ways are best. And they long for something more, something higher, the inheritors of heaven are not murderers, whether it's murder in the heart or murder in the flesh, because they know that God is love and God is life. When the world tells them, don't get mad, get even, they instead leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine and I shall repay, says the Lord. 
They are not sexually immoral, pursuing temporary physical pleasure, distorting the good gift of God for selfish gain. They are not sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. The inheritors of heaven are not sorcerers. They are not those who believe in or rely on any power other than the Holy Spirit. They are not idolaters who worship any God, any person, any creature, or anything less than the one true and living God of the Bible. When the world tells them to look out for number one, that it's all about them, that it's all about success and fame and fortune, that it's all about their goals and dreams and plans to change the world, that it's all about comfort and popularity and acceptance and getting along, that it's all about their kids or that it's all about their academic achievement or their career achievement with titles and degrees or whatever else the world applauds and approves and encourages and trumpets. They say with Jesus, man shall not live by bread alone. The Lord your God only shall you worship and him shall you serve. They are not liars. They always speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because God is truth. They are not flatterers or deceivers. While the world may be deceitful and devious, doing and saying what is necessary to get ahead, the inheritors of heaven operate according to a higher hope and a higher calling. The thirsty, the inheritors of heaven, are not like those who are content to be complacent in this present world. They are not like those who are satisfied with what the temporal pursuits and pleasures the, the world can pay. No, they are compelled by a higher calling, driven on by a deeper thirst that only God can satisfy. That's heaven, where their thirst is fully, finally, and eternally realized. As such, their reward is different. They are satisfied with life, true life, eternal life. The others, however, received the reward they wanted. They chose this world, which really was a choice of death, because death rules this world. So they are given over to death. The second death, true, spiritual, eternal death. What a terrible tragedy. What a sad reality. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis says it this way, quote, There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, Thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is opened. End quote. Heaven is the home for those who want it. It is the heritage for those who want it enough to thirst for it, to wait for it, to seek after it, and to live unsatisfied with a holy discontentment in this world. It is the free gift for those who understand that it is priceless and cannot be earned, bought, or achieved, but can only be received. As we conclude, I want to make a couple of tracks of application. One is for those who are here who are not Christians or who don't know where they stand with God. What about you, if that describes you today? Which type of person are you? Are you the type that will say to God, thy will be done? Or are you the type to whom God says, in the end, thy will be done? What are you living for? Where is your home? Where is your hope? Maybe God in his grace has tugged at your heart today. Maybe he's speaking to you. Maybe he's challenged you and caused you to question if heaven is your home or if this world is. Maybe he's shown you that heaven is really the ultimate fulfillment of your created purpose. Maybe he's given you an understanding that you're not in a reconciled, right relationship with him, and that when you have to stand before him on that day of judgment, that you will stand before him naked and exposed, that there will be fear and guilt and shame, that you'll want to run away from God and not to him. Maybe he's shown you that your life is ultimately or even possibly imminently in danger of death's devastating call. You don't know how much time you have, and you're not ready. Maybe he's caused your heart to rejoice knowing that there is hope for escaping the tears and the mourning and the crying and the pain and the death of this present life, knowing that he is making all things new. So if you're here this morning and that describes you, you're not a Christian, you're not born again, you're not an inheritor of heaven, you're not thirsty for God, it, I ask you to listen carefully now. For all those here who need hope, who need to know that they can have the hope of heaven, I pray that God has caused you to hear this verse. And he said to me, it is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. How can you be saved? How can you be redeemed and reconciled to God? How can you have confidence that heaven is your home, that you are one of his people, and that he is your God? How can you know that death is not the end for you? How can you know that you have eternal life and choose life over the second death? Simple. You have to go to God with your thirst for it. You have to understand that you don't deserve it, that you can't earn it, that you have nothing with which to pay for it but you must be willing to humble yourself to simply go to God and ask for it. Ask him for the water of life. You have to believe that it is done. Remember the words of Jesus on the cross, it is finished. On the cross, Jesus stood in the place of sinners. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. He was made to be sin for us. He took our sin upon himself with its shame and its guilt. And as our sin bearer, he also took the just wrath of God, the anger and the punishment of God, the, the punishment for sin that was due to sinners. He stood in our place between us and God, bearing our sin and God's wrath against that sin. He interposed his precious lifeblood so that we could be forgiven fully, freely, finally forgiven. He was crushed under the wrath of God to the point of death, willingly giving his life while taking our death. They buried him, but on the third day he rose from the grave. He willingly laid down his life on the cross and victoriously took up his life again when he rose from the grave. By dying, he has defeated our death and by rising has restored our life. God says it is done, so there is nothing left for you to do today to be right with him, but to come and receive it. Are you thirsty? If you are, and you've never received the gift of the water of life, today is the day. Go to God and ask for it. Drink deeply of his mercy and salvation in Christ, and you will be saved and satisfied. Now, for those of us who are Christians, for the saints, I trust that many or most of us here today have believed all of that. We have rested and trusted in Christ and have received the soul-satisfying water of the gospel. Probably most of us here, that is true about. What is there here for us in this text? There is much, maybe not much in the way of new content, but much in the way of heart healing hope and much in the way of encouragement. Maybe you're like me. As I was writing some of these words, I was convicted that my love for God is too small and that my desires are very misplaced. Please don't take that as the definitive sign that you're not a Christian. You see, it's possible to truly love someone but at the same time fail to live up to it. I don't know about you, but I do love God. I just don't love him as I ought. I cannot say that I love him fully with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I wish my love for him were deeper. I wish that I was far thirstier than I usually am. I wish he was far more glorified in my life and that I was far more satisfied in him. Are you like me? If you are, let's rest assured that we're in good company and that we're in it together. Let's rest assured that as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he, is, he remembers that we are dust. Let's rest in his grace. Let's ask him for more grace to help us love him more rightly and truly and deeply. Let's work to spend time with him, intentionally developing and growing in that relationship with the Holy Spirit's prompting and assistance. Let us seek him more that we may love him more. Let's put ourselves in a place of greater intimacy and vulnerability before him. Let's put ourselves around like-minded people who can help us and challenge us and spur us on in that love. Let's avoid activity and busyness, even in the church. Let's not confuse activity for God and intimacy with God. Let's lighten our loads and shorten our schedules. Let's make the most of our margin, that's our downtime, our leisure time. Let's seek to put away some of the competing voices that vie for our attention and our affection. Oh, none of this will be easy. It will be very hard indeed. And the reality is, we're going to fail sometimes. But it is worth it. He is worth it. True? I think the greatest application here comes by way of reminding encouragement. Hold on to your hope. In the midst of this present world's fallen state with all its immorality, chaos, crises, clamoring, tears, mourning, crying, pain, and even death, 
Hold on to your hope. Remember where we're headed. Remember home. Whether you're facing uncertain circumstances that cause you to fear this morning, or sorrowful circumstances in which you mourn, or pressure from the world to conform or face the consequences, hold on to your hope. Don't forget that heaven is where God is. He will be with us, and we will be his people, and he will be with us as our God. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and there will be no more of this, mourning, death, crying, and pain. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, it will be worth it in the end. He will make it right in the end. As our memory verse says this, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Paul also says in Romans 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us.